I want us to look at Exodus chapter 19 together today. If y'all will open, find your place there. Did I, oh, there we go. Exodus chapter 19. I would like for you to open that, uh, your Bible, and look on uh, with somebody or find a pew Bible. It's the second book of the Bible. you got Genesis and Exodus. So don't go any further than that. Go to Exodus, and we'll locate chapter 19 in just a moment. You know, what I was thinking is, you know, when I was a child, I was under my parents' authority. And I want you to know up front that I was a poster child for innocence and, and uh, obedience and everything like that. How many of y'all believe that? Okay. Um, I actually, you know, my, my parents put boundaries. They, they, they had expectations. There were certain things that they wanted me to do. And I knew if my mother ever said, you wait till your father gets home, I knew I had crossed a boundary. Actually, I probably knew it before that, but I thought I'd get in the way with something. But accountability does, does come, right? I, I, I remember when I, when I went to, I can distinctly remember when I went, up to, went, went to junior high. You know, a lot of kids, they had middle school. We had junior high. It was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And that was a big step from intermediate school, 6th grade, up to a whole new school in intermediate, I mean, uh, in, uh, uh, in junior high. And, uh, and, and I remember the first day of school that they went over the student handbook with us. They had a student handbook. Uh, and the student handbook revealed to us in this, you know, we were in the gymnasium, a student handbook, that there was a code of conduct uh, there that we were to obey and then you have Mr. Savinsky. Mr. Savinsky was the, was the junior high principal. And Mr. Savinsky was a, was a, a Marine uh, who had fought in the Pacific uh, against the Japanese. And, uh, and, 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 and I'll tell you, he was very intimidating. And on several occasions, Mr. Savinsky introduced me to the Board of Education. I don't think they do the Board of Education anymore. But they, he introduced me to the Board of Education. There was, there, there was a certain code of conduct, things that you need to do, places you need to be, and in order for things to, to flow. You know, I remember when I turned 16, I was very excited because when you turn 16, what do you get? Driver's license. Oh, yeah. Yeah, look out. And, uh, but before I could get my driver's license, you know, you couldn't go down to Walmart and just buy it, you know. Uh, or TGNY, whatever it was at the time. Yeah, they, they gave you a little booklet and you had to learn uh, the rules of the road. You know, later you just ignore all that. You know what I mean? I, I've driven around here in Kingsville. I know all about it. But, but, you know, you had to learn the rules of the road. Then you had a written test. And you had to pass a written test. If you pass a written test, anyway, you had a, uh, you had a state trooper that you rode around with and he, you could prove to him that you understood the rules of the road and then you got your... You got your driver's uh, license. Uh, and, and so that, that was it. You know, there, there are, when you go, you're hired on as certain, uh, certain jobs, they give you a job description. And then they'll tell you that there are certain things that you can do. There are certain uh, office rights and wrongs, and there's a, there, there, there are things that you can and cannot do in the work environment. Uh, and, and so then, we, we know that there are rules there. And then... And then here we are, we're, we, we, we live as citizens in this great country, and, but yet we're under civil authority, civil law. And then we have police officers that help us to keep in line. They remind us occasionally if we kind of drift off, we get in trouble. So, so we're under civil law. Now that, that brings us to what is happening in chapter 19 of, of Exodus. Today's passage, we understand this. We, as believers, live under God's rule and God's authority. And by the way, His rule and His authority is the highest authority. His authority, His rule is over everything else. Amen? I get a witness? His rule and authority is over I don't care if the law says you, you can do this. God says you can't do it. Better listen to God. Amen? And so we want, we want to follow His rule and His authority. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount. When we pray, pray this, His will, His way. Your kingdom come, your will be done. His will, His way. Now I want us to look at the first... Uh, here of Exodus chapter 19. If you found that, I'd like to stand together. I want to read the first 11 verses of this chapter of Exodus chapter 19. Okay, you'll follow along. This is New International Version of Scripture. Whatever version you have, you try to keep up. All right. So this is, uh, this is chapter 19, verse 1. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt. Amen. Egypt is behind them. On that very day, they came to the desert 
of Sinai, desert. By the way, desert will be mentioned several times. After they set up from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to the mountain, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Moses. No, he said, this, <laughs> this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. By the way, don't you love the fact that God is, is connecting these people with their, with their history, with their story? Uh, and tell, tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen, this is verse 4, what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings. Let me tell you something. God does it that way. And brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders and all the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in, the, in a dense cloud. In fact, God is coming to his people. So that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today. And tomorrow, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day, the Lord's coming. <laughs> He's going to come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. God bless the reading of his word. Be seated. I'm glad that you're here today. Are you glad to be here? God is good. We want to hear his word today. Now listen, this is the main point for this message uh, today. And I want you, I want you to gather, gather this in your mind. If you're writing things down, write it down. That God's act of salvation, which is chapters 1 through 18, God is in the business of saving. Amen. God's act of salvation is always followed by God's work of formation, spiritual formation. God is forming his people. And that's kind of where we pick it up here in this passage today. Because previously in the first 18 chapters, God is saving, delivering his people out of, out of Egypt. It's a miracle. God is in the saving business. Salvation is always an act of God. Only he can do it. And he saves them out of, out of the horrifying conditions of slavery. They cried out to the Lord. Some say they didn't even know who they were crying out to. They've been so long in slavery. They're crying out to be delivered. And God heard their cry. He saw the oppression that they were under. Listen, when you cry out to God, God hears you. God hears you. You've been crying out all week and said, God, I need your help. God hears you. And in his timing and in his way, God showed up and, uh, and delivered them. He saved them from something they could not save themselves from. And that's what he does. He saves us out of situation we can't save ourselves from. And listen, there's one thing we have all in common. We're all sinners. And we need to be saved from the, from the shackles, the slavery of sin. And so he saves us from something only he can save us from. And when the people were delivered, you know what they said? They rejoiced. They said, free, free, free. We're free. And look at your neighbor and say, you're free in the Lord. Come on, say it. You're free in the Lord. Say it. You may have to shout it to somebody up front. You're free in the Lord. Amen? Say it louder. You're free in the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's what they said. But here's the, here's the, here's the big question. Freedom f from what? Freedom for what? And that's what he begins to unfold for them. He begins to unfold for them what they're free to do. They're freed from something for someone, for something. See? This, this chapter, verses 1 through 6, really provides the setting for something wonderful. So they've been traveling for 90 days, we are told. Verses 1 through 6. They have traveled approximately 270 miles. And by the way, they're walking the journey. Walk 270 miles, you get an impression of what's going on here. 
And 270 miles tells us that they're some distance from, uh, some distance from Egypt. And they arrived at a very special destination at the foot of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, it, it rises up some 8,000 feet in elevation, which tells us that our God is high and lifted up. Amen? He's holy, he's high and lifted up. So there's, a, there's this immense mountain. And then you heard me say, I stressed it several times, that they're in the desert. Desert. Man, you know, I, I, why in the world is the desert? They've been delivered out of Egypt and they're taken out to the, to the desert. See, it's in this desert area, in the wilderness. Nobody's going to be bothering them there. And it's there in the wilderness that there's this extraordinary stillness. You know, sometimes we just have to get away. Sometimes we have to just get to a place of isolation in order to be still and know that he is still God. And sometimes that's what God wants to do. It seems like a desert, but it's a place of worship. It seems like it's isolated in wilderness, but it's the tabernacle. And God gets us there in that place of isolation in order that we might meet him, right? Extraordinary stillness. And so the stage, the stage is set for this supreme moment. As God meets with his people, he's already revealed himself as deliverer, as savior, but now here's this magnificent moment in which he has brought them out to this place of isolation in order to speak to them. And he's going to speak his word to his people. So this is the time of formation. He's going to speak his word to his people. And we refer to that as the law. It's the law. God's word to his people. And remember that they come out of, out of Egypt. Basically, they were in slavery and there wasn't, there wasn't any law of God there. And so they're brought out, given the law, the boundaries of, of the Lord. And, and when you look at the law of Moses, you look at chapter 19 through 31, and you find this law being written out, given to God's people over a period of time, here at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, you, know, you, you find this law is divided up into three major, three major sections. First is the moral code, which we know very well. We've been learning this in Sunday school since our early childhood. If, if you've been any time in Sunday school as an adult, you've been re saved recently, you've heard the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments have been posted everywhere. The Ten Commandments is the moral law, the moral code. Moral code. Bring, bring up that uh, next slide so we can see that. These are the three areas. I want you to see this. Three areas of, of the law, the moral code, the Ten Commandments. The first four, the first four of those Ten Commandments uh, are, are actually laws about our relationship with, with God. For instance, we, they are told, they are told there's only one God, that they're to have no idols, they're to honor his name, and they're to keep the Sabbath holy, holy. In other words, they're supposed to worship God all the time. M Minda, bring up that next slide for me. Is that, is it not in there? Where's that, go back one. Go up one. It's not in there. Listen to me. Listen to me. It was in there. So we're given the moral code, the Ten Commandments. The first four of those commandments are our relationship with God. And God wants us to keep those commandments. Amen? No other God, no idols. Keep his name, Sabbath day. And then the, then the next six are really our relationship with each other. That's the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, honor your father and mother, not... Uh, not, 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 not kill, not commit adultery, not steal, not lie, not, not, not uh, covet. Those, I think I got them all. If, if I didn't, it's in there. And so these are about how we relate to each other. You know what I'm saying? How we relate to each other. So there are rules. And, and listen, when, we, when we're honoring God, those first four, those first four inform our relationship with each other. Amen? They help us with each other. So that's a moral code. And, and uh, I, I remember there was this church ad, you know, this church ad where you had, the, where you had these, these hands coming out of this cloud and they're holding these, the, 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 the two tablets of the, ten, uh, of the uh, ten Commandments, you know, handing out to people. And it said, for fast, fast relief, 
take two tablets every day. Take two tablets. I, I think that's great. So these are the two tablets that we understand. Margie was sharing the Ten, ten Commandments. It's something that we still guides us today. It's still God's Word. And you say, what's the importance? What's the importance of the uh, moral code? God is in the business of creating an alternative community. He is in the business of creating a different kind of people from the rest of the world. And he does that for, by forming his people. Part of that is the, the moral code. So important. Still important for us uh, today. So, so we become an alternative community. Countercultural, if you will, to everybody else. When they look at us, they say, these people are different. Peculiar. Strange. Set apart. Holy. Then there's the ceremonial, that's the second part, ceremonial law. And, and when you're reading through that, you know how is, you start off reading through the whole Bible and you get to Exodus and they go, man, what is all this? Like a bunch of laws. There's laws, ceremonial laws that has to do with, with, uh, with priests and worship and sacrifices and, and holy seasons and on and on. That's in there. All important. Because God has a way of setting people and, and preparing people in worship. And then, and then the other section is really civil, oh, there it is, judicial law. I don't know where it was in there, but there it is. And this is judicial law or the civil, civil law. And you know, you ever watch Judge Judy? How many of you ever watched Judge Judy? All right, take notice. There's a few people that watch Judge Judy. Listen, Judge Judy is awesome television. But you watch Judge Judy, and you know, a lot of times there are the, these things, and neighbors have disputes, and somebody cut a limb off the tree, and they want compensation for that. They killed the goat, they killed the cat, something happened. They didn't mean it, it backed into the neighbor's, you know, shrubbery. And so there's all kinds of civil law. Y'all with me on that? You know, I borrowed money, they didn't pay it back, I want it back, you know, so then, anyway. So there's civil law. So all of that is a part what we find in this law. And it's all important because every step of the way, God is creating a people for him. <laughs> I'm not dancing up here. I'm trying to get that chord working. You know what that's called? It's a holy people. You're holy. You're a holy people. They're a holy people. What that means is they were set up set apart <laughs> from something, from a past. They were set apart from a taskmaster, from Egypt. They were set apart from something, for something. So, holy and acceptable. All right. And acceptable. Let's use this right here. Oh, I don't want to be tied to that because I was going to jump off at one point. All right. All right, is this better? All right. Holy. Oh, oh a little, little less heat. All right. Holy and acceptable unto the Lord. So we're set apart from something. Set apart from something unto something. We're set apart to the Lord, right? So I want you to, I want you to jot this down, that God's act of salvation is always moving us from our former life. Man, the former life is always luring, always wanting. Sometimes we're not very far from it. It's always there. It's the old nature. But we've got to crucify that old nature. He's always moving us from the former life to the new life that he has for us. All they'd ever known was Egypt. All they'd ever known was their former life, death and destruction. All they ever known was what was in Egypt for them. It was desperate and, and God delivered from them from that. And here I want you to write this not. Not only is transition, transition from that former life possible, but it's also expected. And we need to work on it. That's the reason why, listen, we're talking about discipleship. It doesn't come automatically. It's something that we work at. We work at daily in order to surrender ourselves. We're growing in His Word, growing with, with Him. It is expected. Because I want you to keep in mind, it was one thing to get them out of Egypt. Is another thing to get Egypt out of them. Amen. You know what I'm saying? It takes time, but there's an expectation that they're going to come out of Egypt, and Egypt's going to come out of them along the way. How in the world does that happen? And we still struggle with our old former life, don't we? I bet many of us struggle this way. Anybody have a real juicy sin to testify to? Just stand up. Real juicy. Man, if we juicy, if we got up and told some juicy sins, it'd fill this place up. I'm telling you, we need Thanksgiving. Man, it was like. It was better than any soap opera. We need to do that. Listen, all of us struggle 
with the with the former we, we are moving forward that's this discipleship is always moving us forward so yes how in the world do we get freedom from how do we get we get freedom from in God's salvation how, how in the world does that happen I, I, I want to talk about these these three things they are gonna come up here three things all right one is through relationship I don't care what else you do during the week the most important the most important thing that we can do is spend time with the Lord and that's what we're doing today this whole thing is about him what we're doing here every song every word everything we testify every hand clapping everything is to the glory of the Lord who has saved us and deliver us and is and is changing our lives amen everything is for him so it's relationship verse 4 they're really coming to come to understand who is this God who is he he is the God who saves we, you know it you know for me I was I, I, I bent my knees at, a, at, a, at the steps we called an altar at, Re, at Refuge Baptist Church when I was a teenager and that was the place where I met God as Savior of my life and he saved me he saved me right so we understand that if you've been saved say amen some of us may be in the process but we know he is Savior and he says in verse 4 you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt boy did he put a number on them amen and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you where y'all see that in verse 4 brought you where brought me where say it loud to myself the whole reason he saves us is to bring us into relationship with him you say Lord I've done a lot of good things for you yeah you say Lord I, I I've given a lot of stuff for you yeah that's not what I want first what does he want first he wants us with him you know, it's, it's just like any relationship Man, you say I got a real love relationship with my with 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 my you know spouse here, uh, and uh, you know I see her at least what an hour a week or so. Man, it's perfect. What would you think on that? You say no way. The only way you can have a real nurturing, loving relationship, is spend time with somebody. You got to spend time with them. So he said, I saved you. I brought you to myself. It's relationship. Now just think just a moment. How's your relationship with the Lord? How much time we're spending with the Lord? It's so important. Here's the second thing. He said, how are we going to be delivered from Egypt? How are we really going to meet with that expectation of transformation, not only the presence of the Lord, relationship with the Lord, but through a covenantal agreement? And that's verse 5. But basically, the covenant is a covenant with the law. God's agreement is this. He said, I save you, I will save you, bring you to myself, bring you to myself, and, and you will receive all my blessings and you will receive all my, all my protection and you will, receive my, you will receive all the things that I have for you if you will obey me. If you, if you will walk with me, be my people. And listen, we're not, talking about the, we're not talking about the law as saving us. We're talking about God as saving us, coming into relationship with him and the covenant agreement is just simply this it is nurturing that love uh, that love arrangement God reaches to us because he loves us why do your parents put boundaries for you why are there boundaries for us in our community it's because it's because it's in our best interest that we obey the law is not meant to save the law is meant to bring out of us the very best. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I have come so that you might have a mediocre life. Did y'all hear that? I just want to see who's sleeping. He said, I have come that you could have some of what I have to offer you. He said, I have come so that you might have life and it in extreme abundance. Amen? And that's what he says. That's his covenant agreement with us. We come to him. We're filled with his Holy Spirit. He fills us up and we receive blessing. And then he guides us in the things that he wants us to do. And along the way we receive his blessing. But we already know that if we distance ourselves, we don't spend time with him. We go our own way. Mm -mm. We're in trouble. 
Even then, in the midst of that, God says, I'm with you. I love you. I love you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redirect. I'm going to change things. I want you to come be with me. Verse 5 says, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. In a beautiful word? All God wants is us. The very reason why we're created is to be with Him. And He just says, if we'll do things His way, and by the way, have you noticed that doing things God's way always turns out far better? <laughs> then if I do things myself, I say, oh God, you don't know what you're talking about here. I'm going to go do this myself and watch what I can do. Ah! Off the edge. I know that some of you just woke up. I'm telling you, off the edge, there we go. It's just a disaster. It's a train wreck. And I'll tell you something, whenever I've had a train wreck, what does God say? He comes up on the scene and says, I want you to know something. I've never left you. I love you still. That's God's love. You say, man, Pastor, my life has been a train wreck. Yeah, God knows all about it. But He's with you. And even in that, and we can't dismiss getting right. We use the word repentance, turning around getting right, going with God. I don't know how many times we've been there. Many of us have been there. We've tasted of the bitterness of our own self-centered lives. But it became a learning experience. It became a deepening. And God says, I got you. I just love that. So it's relationship. It's covenantal agreement. How in the world are our lives going to change? Well, here it is. Transformational purpose and power. All right, transformational purpose and power. Listen. What we know is, this is what Ephesians uh, 5.10 says, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're His workmanship. So what the word used there is called a divine passive. That's why I get paid the big bucks, because I know that. <laughs> a divine passive. You know what that means? The very word that says over the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew word that says, in the beginning God created. Is the, is the Greek word equivalent to that over in Ephesians 5, 10, where it says that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. In either instance, whether God took nothing and made something from it, or He took our old miserable, sin-laden, Egyptian bondage lives and saved us, it, he, he did that, and He begins a miracle, a miracle of transformation. He takes a pretty rough, lump of clay like me and makes me into something beautiful. Get that on the camera. I'm just going to pose for a minute. You may not think I'm beautiful, but my mother thought I was. And God thinks I'm beautiful. See, it's not, when He sees me, He doesn't see all my sin and all my ugliness. He sees His Son, Jesus Christ. And He's in the business of transforming us but would you please hear this? He never saves us and delivers us and begins the transformational process for us to do what we want. It's always for a purpose. He brought us to Himself that we might walk with Him, His way, His will, His way, His will, in love relationship with Him for a purpose. So we might be on display glorifying Him through the mighty works in our lives. People see us and they say, man, what's the difference in your life? I say, God did that. God's at work in my life. I can't give testimony to anything I've done. But He wooed me and loved me, brought in a relationship with Him. And I am who I am by Him. So He's always given us a purpose. Now listen to this. And uh, I, I think it was at verse... verse Six, I think it is uh, it, it says you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation the Apostle Peter said to the church the very same thing in Christ we are to be a priesthood a priesthood of people priesthood in other words wherever we're going we're setting a blessing on people y'all with me we're setting a blessing on people we're sharing Jesus we're breaking down barriers there's a breakthrough on behalf of somebody we're priesthood of nation. We are a holy nation of priests. And God is in the business of changing us. We're going to have around our neck this sign that says under construction, right? New people, new thinking, new purpose, new direction. And please write this down that passion for God is practiced within the context of obedience. 
It's obedience. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you tell, you tell you, your, your child, you say, now I want you to go and do something. And they say, yes, Father, yes, Mother, I will go and do it right now. And then they go and they don't do it. You say, that's not obedience. Would you be okay with that? No, it is God. So it's His Word, His will, His way. In verse 8 it says, The people all responded together in unison. We will do everything the Lord has said. And Moses brought the answer back to the Lord. We will do everything the Lord has said. Amen? We will do everything the Lord has said. Now, all of that to say, bring us to verses 10, 11, and 12. You see that in your scripture? You see that in the Bible, chapter 19. And I think the key word here is the word consecration. And I want you to know it was true then, and it's true when we come to worship. It's the word consecration. It's a word of setting apart. It is, it's a word of, of making right. It's, it's a preparation, a sacredness. It's making holy, okay? And so Moses, God told Moses, tell the people to get prepared. First day, second day, because on the third day, on the third day, they're going to meet with the Lord. The Lord is coming. So, so we need to take this very seriously. We're going to meet with the Lord. He tells them that there's a spiritual side to that. Get your heart ready. There, there's a spiritual side. He even told them, clean their clothes, get their clothes washed. Amen. If you got a kid's not washing their clothes, got the same pair of jeans all week, hey, get a bath. You know what I'm saying? So he says, get their clothes ready. They're going to meet with God. Consecrated dedication. And it's just preparation to meet with the Lord, to meet with majesty. Uh, it, it's, it's like preparing to, to touch electricity or dynamite, or radiation, or a baby diaper. I mean, it's getting ready. It's getting ready to, to touch something. You say, man. And then look at chapter 19, verse 17 through 25. You'll see that. The Lord descends. He says, God says, on the third day I'm going to come in a dense cloud, and there's lightning, and thunder, and smoke, and fire. And these are all supernatural events. And the, characterize, the characterization is that when God comes to a place, when God comes, there's a disturbing intrusion, if you will. It is immensely disruptive. When God shows up, He speaks to us and it just challenges us and it changes us. And people tremble when the Lord shows up. If we've not trembled in a while, it may be that we've not seen the Lord in a while. When the Lord shows up, there's a trembling. You know what I'm talking about? Don't we need that, people? That's verse 16. When He shows up, don't we need that trembling, that awe of who He is? And when He shows up and He speaks to our heart through His Word and through His presence, He confronts he confronts us in our shallow ways. He conforms us to His life. And He calls for commitment to His will. But you know what I love about verses 16 through 25? It tells us that our God, though mighty and awesome and majestic, though powerful, yet He's approaching. And it's very incarnational. God is coming to us. And He is preparing us for that day. And His coming in Jesus Christ. He's very approachable. And He's coming. And that day, at the foot of Mount Sinai, was for them what the day of Pentecost was for the early Christians. It was Pentecost. And humanly speaking, it was indescribable. They trembled at the presence of the Lord. You know what I thought about? I thought about getting ready to meet the Lord. I thought about... The times I was getting ready to meet Stacy on a date. Man, I was going through my poetry phase. You know, I was writing things out. I was writing things out. Her name on everything that I had. Everything. I know it. I was a grown adult man, but I was writing her name, everything. I was swirling letters and, and putting heart-shaped things. I was smitten. Absolutely smitten. And, of course, she was too. She just didn't know any better. That's her heart. And... And I was thinking about those times I'd get ready on day. I'd call, hey, baby. It's me. You want to go out? She said, oh, I've been waiting for you to call. I've been just waiting for you to call. And then she'd say, oh, yeah, we'll go out. So you know what I'd do? Man, I'd, I'd get my clothes ready. I mean, they were pressed. They were red pressed. Well, I don't know about pressed. But they were ready to clean take a nice, good shower. I, I, I'd be rehearsing, rehearsing what I was going to say to her. Rehearsing, you know, what I was going to say. I'd take, I'd take out some aqua velva. I, I'd say, take out some really high-priced cologne, splatter it all over. 
You know, some soap on a rope. Y'all remember that? You know, some old spice. I just lathered myself up with that. And then I go pick her up. And that sweet, precious thing get in the vehicle with me and we go off. My heart just pattering. Because we're in the presence of each other. Now, if we understand that on a date, then we understand what it is to get ourselves ready to prepare to meet with the Lord. And that's what God was doing. God's not about the rules and the regulations. That's not it. He's about bringing our very best self out out of love. That's what He wants for you, and that's what He wants for me.